Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Auto Insurance is Ripe for a Major Disruption Due to the Pandemic. Please note that your microphones have been muted, and we encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the session using the Q&A or chat functionality. We will respond to as many questions as possible in the last 15 minutes of the session. This webinar will be recorded, and you will each receive a link to the content following the session. Today's session is hosted by Siraj Barwani, who is our Chief of Strategy at Acuity Ads with 25 years as a digital advertising specialist. We're also lucky to be joined today by Edward Gold, former head of PNC Marketing, Media and Sponsorships at State Farm. Acuity Ads is a leading technology company that provides marketers a one-stop solution for omni-channel digital advertising with best of class, um, best of category return on advertising spend. Without further delay, I'll pass it to Siraj. Thank you, Joanna. Appreciate it. Hello, Ed. Very delighted to have you here today. Pleasure to be here, Siraj. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been an exciting ride, you know, all these years. Um, Absolutely. Let me uh, let me do a little bit of a setup, and uh, then Ed will actually come to you. Okay. Sounds great. Welcome, everyone. So glad you could actually join us today. Um, let me give you a little bit of a setup in terms of what we are dealing with here. Our focus today is property and casualty insurance industry. For those of you who are in the industry, you know how big this category is. It's a huge business. It's close to 700 billion, as you can see in the market size. And the property casualty portion of the insurance category, especially you can see the the, the premiums written in the US, that's a pretty large share of that, right? So that's big. In terms of the big companies, the big names and big participants, you can say State Farm is out there, way up there with the lead market share. Frankly, I had no qualms, questions about State Farm's leadership ever since I visited Ed, I don't know how many years ago, Ed, when I came there in Bloomington, Illinois to really check out you know, and meet with you in person. But you just had to be in the lobby to see the history that's laid out. Uh, and it's going to be what? It's going to be almost 100 years old now, a century? Yeah, it'll be 100 years next year. Wow. So, OK, like all right. I know. I mean, it's got heritage. It's a very established company. So there it is. State Farm is there. And frankly, the, some of the names and the suspects are pretty well known in you know, the progressives of the world and so forth. And for those of you who are wondering, could there actually be a PNC insurance presentation without the lizard on it? Well, here you go. Just for, just for your entertainment, we have the gecko in here as well. It's hard to avoid the gecko as the amount of advertising uh, uh, Geico actually does, which leads me to the next point. Auto insurance is really not about hurting at all in terms of the amount of media spend that you see annually in this category. It's phenomenal. Uh, some of the data, Ed, you actually shared with us. I mean, this is huge, right? I and mean, we're talking about over a billion dollars, you know, spent by Berkshire Hathaway, which is, of course, you know, so much of that is Geico, Progressive State Farm, all of these, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars that are being spent. And well, you're talking. Suraj, you know, just to make a point here, you're, you're talking about Geico uh, spending nearly 1.6 billion in just measured media. Yeah, you know, it actually makes them the single largest single brand spender in the United States of America. Not not including like the PNGs or or some of the car companies as different models and different brands within there, but just the single biggest one brand spender. It's 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 an incredible amount of money to be spending. I know, I know, and. And I think all of this is fine and good. You know, I mean, over the years, Ed, you've actually seen the history of this thing over the past couple of decades in terms of where all this money really goes and what kind of growth it actually drives. But today's conversation is going to be how the shifts are beginning to come about in this marketplace, right? And Absolutely. is this money going in the right place? Is it really driving profitable, uh, you know, um, customers, all of that is the big question here. So with that, Ed, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, let the audience really know. I obviously know you very well. And frankly, 
uh, couldn't be more grateful for all the opportunities you gave us to work with State Farm over the years. It was truly a delight and we learned a lot together. Um, but please talk about yourself. How, how did you get into, first of all, advertising and media and then in the insurance business? Well, you know, I'd like to say that I was that, that this is a really happy week for me, but when the University of Illinois lost to Loyola in the NCAA tournament, um, you know, it, it's kind of been a bit of a bittersweet week. Uh, but uh, from that standpoint, you know, came out of college, knew I wanted to be in advertising, uh, went to work at DDB in Chicago, uh, and was there for, you know, 11 or 12 years and, re, you know, brought up through media. And, and the sponsorship world, and it was great. Loved, loved working in advertising. Got to work on various different types of accounts, whether it was including uh, State Farm, who's a longtime uh, client of DDBs in Chicago, but worked on Bud Light, Energizer Batteries, Wilson Sporting Goods, uh, Meritech during the day, and, and a whole bunch of others. And it was a great, great experience. And, you know, went off, did a few other things, and then uh, it happened to be that State Farm was looking for someone to oversee all of their media and sponsorship activity. I was actually living out in Malibu, California at the time and, uh, you know, interviewed, got hired and actually moved from Malibu, California to Bloomington, Illinois. Let's what? just talk two different sides of quite the Quite a switch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite, quite, a switch. A, quite a switch, but... Uh, you know, as, as my wife and I like to joke, you know, we moved, we had moved to Bloomington about uh, 17 years ago, and we had the 16 year old and 15 year old boys to prove it. So, um, so it was a great run. And certainly, you know, the State Farm business from when I worked on it at the agency to when I went, when I went to State Farm, you know, it was totally different. Um, you know, certainly there were a lot of things that were the same, but but what was a very sleepy category of insurance advertising. In fact, most of my time when I was at DDP, we never mentioned the words auto insurance in any of our advertising because they didn't need to grow it. You know, it was, it was, they, they had enough, you know, you got to, you know, this is an insurance company. You have to spread out the risk. You can't take on too much of the risk. Uh, but then certainly when I started at State Farm in 2003, um, you know, the market had changed, you know, Geico and Progressive had come on. Um, it was, and, and the market was starting to spend, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And now, you know, we're talking billions of dollars um, in, in this category. And, and certainly when you look at it, you know, uh, Geico, you know, just using them as the example, I mean, you could use Progressive as well. These were relatively smaller companies back in the day. But, you know, if you ever wanted to write a business case on marketing and what marketing can do, uh, just look at uh, what Geico has done by saying 15% 15, 15, in 15 minutes or what Geico has done through or Progressive has done through the, you know, uh, whether it's the name your price tool flow or come to our site and we'll give you our quote and three others. Um, and, and just everything that's gone into this category has certainly uh, swept it from being a, a nice sleepy category to probably the most ultra competitive category, you know, in the United States. And, you know, and I worked on beer during the, the heydays and, you know, it was just Bud Light, Miller Light and Coors Light. Now, you know, you're talking about State Farm, Allstate, Geico, Progressive, Liberty Mutual, Nationwide, USAA, all these people are spending hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, and it is, it is ridiculously competitive. Yeah, yeah, it, it's very interesting. And how far it's actually come, and for State Farm to be able to stay at the leading position is quite impressive. So over the years, you've worked on tons of programs, Ed, tons of them. Yeah. Um, just show some highlights. Give us some idea of the some of the programs that are really truly memorable for you. <laughs> where you felt, you know what, these things that really moved the needle and it was noticeable, right? Because when you have so much money being spent in a category, rising above the noise is hard, right? And yet you guys were able to do uh, some really noteworthy things, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as State Farm being the leader in the category for the last 78 or nine years, you know, certainly we've done a lot and needed to you know, assert our leadership position, even if we weren't 
the spending leader in the category. So, you know, what we've done in the NBA by, you know, creating those behind the, those ubiquitous behind the backboard signs and in college basketball and with 26 of the 30 NBA teams, everything that we've done from State Farm being an NBA partner to our working with Chris Paul and certainly other uh, NBA stars along the lines. And then, you know, all the media that we do around that, you know, that is certainly one of the bigger highlights. Um, just, just, you know, on the right-hand side, you know, show a picture of Lightning McQueen. That's probably the first time where State Farm really stepped out of what was being, you know, a traditional marketer and, and stepped outside itself and did something bigger where we partnered with Disney Pixar on the movie Cars. Really couldn't come up with a more perfect, you know, movie than, than the movie Cars for an insurance brand to sponsor. Um, and, you know, we saw that really move the needle. You had, you know, you know, State Farm at the time had like 17,000 agents. We had almost 15,000 agents participating in the program, buying merchandise and really, you know, owning this and, and certainly saw growth during that opportunity as well. Um, you know, some of the other stuff we've done or I've done is, you know, and, and this is really about being there first because this is such a competitive category. If you don't do something and you pass on something, you actually know that someone else in the category is going to buy it. You know, when, when State Farm was an NCAA partner and we decided to get out of it, you know, Allstate bought it the next year. Allstate dropped out of it. Now Geico's the sponsor. So it's really, you have to get there before the other guy. And one of the places most recently we really did that was in the esports world. And State Farm, you know, jumped in uh, as probably the first non-endemic brand to really get involved in the esport and gaming marketplace. You know, I'll give Geico a little credit. They were doing some stuff with one of the teams, but we really stepped up in more of a uh, league partnership with League of Legends and Overwatch. We partnered with Dr. Lupo from a, from a Twitch standpoint, from a Twitch influencer standpoint. And so really did a lot there because this is certainly the future of where the audience is going, you know, in, in esports and in gaming. I watch my own 16 and 15 year olds, and they don't even know what a television is. Um, they just watch everything on a five inch screen or, you know, on their computer screen. So, you know, that was, those have definitely been some key programs, probably the, you know, on the digital side of things, you know, we were definitely an early adopter of programmatic uh, from that standpoint. You're talking again about the auto insurance category. There is no more competitive place than search from an auto insurance standpoint. And I think it's been quoted many times that auto insurance and car insurance are the second and third most expensive keywords on Google. So therefore we really needed to look for different places and different ways to target our audience at certainly a much cheaper uh, cost per click than Google was uh, providing. And so really, you know, took on programmatic uh, from that standpoint. And then, you know, within the programmatic world and working with Axiom and LiveRamp, looking at the opportunity to target customers, you know, using our first party data and really targeting customers with one message and non-customers with our auto and home message, because why would I need to put another auto insurance ad in front of a customer? I'd rather put a life insurance ad in front of them and get much more efficient in my auto insurance spend and just put that in front of people we wanted to bring into State Farm. So those are probably some of the highlights, you know, I mean, obviously this is a you know, awesome category. You know, it's it's so funny I say that because nobody would really think, wow, you work on insurance. That's not that cool. You know, from a media and sponsorship and, and marketing standpoint, I really think auto insurance is is the coolest um, you know, category to work on right now. Well, I, you know, hearing you describe it that way, it absolutely sounds cool. Seriously, uh, <laughs> in, in the way, oh, because, you're, because you're so passionate about it. You know, you've spent your time and it's really, really very, very interesting. I think the way you say it, there's the other advantage that State Farms with multi-line product offerings has those types of advantages where you can play one off of the other and really build the synergies, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. especially from a media standpoint and how we targeted, and even you know to to talk about what uh, Acuity and and State Farm did along with our uh, agency partners in our Agent Tag Media program, where we're doing a national effort, but bringing it down to the local agent level, um, and you know into the zip codes that they target, 
um, specifically for their business. It's just the, I mean, I want to say it's the miracle of the internet, but it is the miracle of the internet. It allows us to do things beyond just mass targeting people, but really targeting people based on what we know or what we believe or want to sell them, you know, or what their needs are certain. So from yeah, the market. But, but Ed, there was something else. You're being very humble. There is something else you did here, which was very, very impressive the first time we engaged with you on this program. And that was you had a partnership. Like you had to have the agent having a little skin in the game here because they oh, had absolutely. to invest. They had to invest, which means that you knew that it was working if the agent was interested in contributing to partially to the media, right? And so you are really building that relationship with the agents and like jointly working on the programs, right? Well, absolutely. I mean, the agents are State Farm's, you know, core advantage versus the competition. There are still so many, you know, while, while we will talk about people shopping and people wanting not to do business with agents and, and stuff like that, you know, I think from a state farm standpoint and from all state and some of the other uh, agent based companies, there's a lot of people that still want to do business with a human. You yeah, know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're talking about insurance here. It's not just an 18 to 34 year old, you know, audience targeted purchase product. This is something people from 18 to 80 need. And so, you know, you have to be able to, you know, work with businesses across the way or across, not work with businesses, but work with people the way that they want to be worked with. Exactly. And so, you know, having those 19,000 State Farm agents now is definitely going to be a core advantage to them. And certainly, you know, branding them in their home local market, you know, is certainly key to them and helping them grow their business. No, it totally makes sense. So, you know, let's switch gears a little bit. Now, you know, so much has happened in the world just in the last 14 months or so, right? Things have turned totally upside down. There isn't a category that has not been affected by it, right? And yep. so the same thing is happening here. Let's start with the consumer behavior shifts. What is really happening with the consumer with implications for the industry? Well, I mean, I think from, from the overall standpoint, the consumer overall is in that much more control of what they're doing and how they're doing it, you know? and and who they're shopping with. I mean, you know, it's been interesting, you know, living in a condo building now here in Chicago, how many packages from Amazon show up at the building or how many different people subscribe to Home Chef or, or Fresh Chef or a number of the food delivery uh, folks. It's, it's, it is changing the way people are interacting with everything. I mean, I look at my own media habits and I'm, you know, a little bit older, been around, remember, Saturday morning cartoons and and just looking at how people and where their where their viewing habits start. You know, people are still using television. You know, nobody's moved away from television per se or video, but it's what they're consuming and how they're consuming it. You know, you know, I used to start on the big networks, move to cable, and then think about, oh, I have a Netflix subscription. Great, let's see what's on Netflix if nothing's on television. Now I'm starting on Netflix. I'm starting on a place where there's no advertising, you know, and, and this is a consumer dynamic that is certainly changing how marketers overall need to think about how we are supporting our products and who we're targeting and how we're doing it. I, I think from the insurance standpoint, there is no doubt that people are thinking about and shopping their insurance more than they ever have. You know, and there are certainly a couple of factors that have gone into that. First of all, you've had more people unemployed in this marketplace since the Great Recession of, of 2008-9, at least in, in most of our lifetimes. And, and whenever people are unemployed, they have to look at every line item of their, of their personal finances and go, you know, do I need this? How important is this? Is this a necessary or is this a luxury? Can I save money? So I think there's been a significant amount of more shopping going on for, from that consumer standpoint in this marketplace. I remember back in 2008 and 9 when, when every other marketing category was spending less because, the, because of where the consumer was at, the insurance category continued to spend more. 
you know, spending went up in the category because the price messaging that has become, you know, out there in the marketplace from the Geico's and Progressive and everybody else, it gives people pause and gives them a reason to shop their insurance. I also think that, you know, you and I were just talking about this before we started this. You haven't been on a plane in 15 months. I haven't been on a plane in 12 months. I'm actually working out of a friend's office, but most people are still working, you know, working um, from home. People aren't driving as much. We've seen all the insurance companies rebating customers, you know, for because their loss ratios are going down because nobody's driving, nobody's getting into accidents. Um, and and we're just seeing so much change in the marketplace that it is causing people that have never thought about shopping their insurance to think about shopping. Even those better preferred drivers are thinking about how they could save money in this marketplace, especially at this time. And you know, and a lot of the advertising you're seeing from, from the marketplace is very save money or save money because you're a better driver, whether it's state firms drive safe and save, all states drive wise, uh, progressive snapshot, and all the different usage based insurance, telematics based, you know, um, use of data to basically price the consumer's insurance differently based on how they drive. They're a better driver, they should pay less. It's just yeah. simple. It's very interesting. You see the devices now, the telematics that you're talking about. Look yep. at the look at the usage based tracking through telematics that's going on. Automotive and home both are at the very, very top end of the insurance industry, right? It's amazing. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's very hard to tell someone to put a life monitor, you know, I got my Fitbit right here, right? You know, it's very hard to tell somebody, you know, wear a Fitbit and, you know, you can save money on your life insurance. But, you know, everybody thinks they're a good driver. So if they think they're a good driver, and they think they can save money, then yeah, they might work with a telematic, telematics usage-based device to try to save money on their insurance. Yep. And it, you know, and most of the insurance companies position it as your rates won't get any worse, no matter what type of driver you are. Mm -hmm. It can only get better. Yeah. So, yeah. so the movement towards usage-based looks like it's going to pick up some steam here, right? given well, sort of the behavior you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, not only are, are the current big insurance companies looking at more usage based, but then you have a number of, you know, digital disruptive companies like Metro Mile and uh, other companies that are literally pay by the mile insurance. You know, if you drive mm -hmm. less, you could pay less. Yep. Not just based on do I drive over 12,000 miles a year or do I drive less than 12,000 miles a year? Yeah. So let's let's uh, let's talk about that. So now with these types of shifts that you're talking about, right? People definitely searching, shopping around a lot. There's another behavior that we have. Significantly more people, to your point, are actually shopping around for insurance now, right? For all the reasons that you gave. Look, insurance is literally at one of the top two categories of where more shopping behavior is beginning to get exercised, right? So given yeah, yeah. that. Given that, Ed, you know, you've really been advising us where this industry is going to finally go and where you could expect future growth and in particular profitable growth is going to be achieved and what you would want to see the industry move toward. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Certainly we've internally spoken and you're advising us to really do the right things for this industry. But from your angle, the audience would be very interested in knowing sort of where where do you want to take this thing here next? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, obviously, having worked in this industry a long time and seeing what everybody is doing, you know, there's really been a difference of whether you want to, you know, um, write the more profitable type of business, which is known as preferred, or whether, you know, you're willing to write some of the less profitable business, you know, known as uh, standard or non-standard business. And the, and the difference really being those people that, you know, the real difference is those people who don't get in accidents and don't have any moving violations versus those that do. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're a safer driver, if you're a better driver and you don't get in accidents and you don't get moving violations, you're you're in what's known as the preferred audience. And that is the profitable area for insurance companies. It's mm-hmm. very hard to make money, even though they can do it and, and a number of companies do on the standard and, and non-standard business. The, but the preferred audience is where everybody would like to grow because it's the profitable business. And that is really that, you know, when you talk about the consumer journey and how people are, you know, thinking about, you know, shopping their insurance and what companies they're going to shop with, you know, those people shop an average of three to four companies when they decide to shop and they shop very quickly. This is not a category where people take months to figure it out. When they decide to shop, they're shopping. They want to get in and out. It's not, it's not exactly as fun as shopping for a new suit or a new dress or a new car. This mm-hmm. is insurance. It's not exactly the funnest for the consumer, but right. but right. really being able to target this preferred audience is what you and what you and I and Acuity have been really working on. You know, we know from an overall standpoint that there are some generally accepted characteristics of a preferred driver, someone who's 25 plus. You know, obviously anybody 17, 18 years old is not really a great driver yet. So, you know, you're looking at someone who's a little bit older, someone who owns a home that has taken on responsibility beyond just, you know, owning a car, but now they own a home. So they tend to be safer drivers. And then people who have good credit rating. You know, if your credit rating is good, it usually means, you know, you're, you think less risky, you take, you know, you take less risk and that's, that that's across the board. And so if you have, if you have a better credit rating, we tend to put you into the preferred category. The only issue is that, you know, Siraj, you and I could live next door to each other. We could have very similar jobs. We get very, we could drive very similar cars. We're over the age of 25, but gosh darn it, you have a lead foot, Siraj. You drive fast, you know, and I don't. I'm a a safer driver. And so the opportunity that we're really looking into is how do we now look into someone's actual driving habits, you know, and their driver history to really, to really target this audience and to really define the difference between a preferred driver standard and non-standard to when you are looking at this from a programmatic standpoint and a digital standpoint. You know, this is something that we're able to do or we're able to do from a direct mail standpoint and really utilizing driver history data to help us figure out who we wanted to mail to. And it's really been one of those things I've been really thinking about uh, since I left State Farm is how do, how do you get that into the programmatic world? Because that is where this industry should be thinking about, especially when you start thinking about that there are these big four competitors, five competitors spending a half a billion to a billion and a half dollars. And if you're a smaller company, you know, you have to get that much more efficient with your dollars. I mean, even though, you know, at the time State Farm was spending five, six hundred million dollars on insurance, it's very hard to say that a half a billion dollars doesn't go as far as when your competitor is spending a billion and a half. And so, you know, even even in our case, you know, we needed to get that much more efficient in what we were spending. And I probably said that before, but it's a key point here is that if you can target just people who you know you can write, who are that preferred business, or, you know, you could also take it the other way. If you really wanted to target standard drivers or non-standard drivers, if we had this driver history data available to us, uh, this, this would be the key to helping us really take programmatic to the next level from in an auto insurance industry standpoint. Got it, got it. No, I think I think that's very important to put in context because you know, while programmatic advertising has been around for good 15 years, as you know, and you've used it and we worked with yeah. you more, uh, is just that this type of data has just not been available as readily accessible for real-time targeting and selection and with overlays with third-party data sets all of that stuff is just becoming far more sophisticated now. So it's becoming more possible. And I think to be able to do that is truly phenomenal, right? Now, the yeah, next I mean, I part, think, go ahead, please, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's, you know, 
that's the next phase of, of the data that we can utilize. And, and I think certainly as, as cookies start going away and as we really need to think about other sources of data, you know, programmatic has been great because we've been able to, you know, know if somebody's on Zillow.com, you know, they're shopping for a home or if they're on cars.com, they're shopping for a car. You know, a lot of that's going to go away with the cookie. And so now we need to think about these new data sources to make the programmatic world still work, yes. you know, the way we want it to Absolutely. for our brain. Agree, completely agree. Now, the second point you mentioned was the journey, the yes. experience. And it's all about how people and how long people stay in the market. And it is not that they stay in the market that long, to your point, right? The auto insurance may be much shorter period, maybe a couple of weeks or whatever it is, home insurance perhaps maybe three, four weeks, you know, it's just not months clearly, right? right. Yep. And so that's really where now, where, yeah, this... that's... go ahead, please. Yeah, so, so that's one of the things that I love about, you know, partnering with you on, you and Acuity on this is because of what you guys are doing uh, from an overall programmatic standpoint, but also what you're doing with your Illumin platform and really looking at the customer journey across various different points of entry into that journey so that you're targeting them appropriate, whether they're at the beginning of searching or whether they're you know that much further down the funnel. So I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, no, so that's, that's critical. That's very important, thank you. So for the audience to know really how we got together with Ed was to build this unique solution for the uh, PNC industry. Uh, we are focused a lot today's discussion with automotive, but you will see how it would be relevant, not just into other adjacent in industries, including home property and so forth, right? But the journey element is like once you are in the game of really going after your preferred audience, the fact is how do you map that journey quickly, know exactly where the user are in their decision-making process so that you can really map it and get it right there at that moment with the right messaging and so forth so that you really have a good shot at being considered and being top of mind for the consumer, right? That's the idea. And to be able to do that, you take not just the driver history data that you guys all see on the slide here, but Acuity has had benefits of search data, attention data on video viewing, um, and social data in terms of user intent and what they are thinking about and so forth. All of it, when you combine it, it really positions you as to where the user is in their decision-making process so that you can really fine tune it. So for example, here's a woman who's actually searching for the point you made about usage base. She's searching for usage base insurance. There you go, right? Somehow she must have heard like, there's a way to save it because I'm not driving as much. Why not, right? Should look around. So yes, we're looking for, of course, their driver history, but then all the ways in which we can pinpoint where is she in her consideration, right? That's very important. Here's another one who is a collector of classic cars. I mean, this is interesting. We are learning it as you, as you and I have talked about this thing. There's a, a, a lot of interest these days in like collecting all these nice, you know, uh, vintage items. It's, it, it's unbelievable how much uh, you know, and certainly it's showing some of the disparity between the haves and the have nots, but how much alternate alternative assets yes. are just increasing in value, whether it's, you know, baseball cards or classic cars or everything, you know, the people with money still have money yes. and they are, you know, looking for places to invest and things just keep going up, up and up. And so, yeah, exactly. So yeah. here, you know, a lot of these, the statistics actually say a lot of these classic car collectors actually just keep the car in the garage. They are proud of what they are actually owning. They don't really That's drive great. them around much, you know. And so I think the same thing, you know, for many reasons, they are just as attractive for certain types of insurance companies who write insurance for these types of big ticket items, right? Uh, Absolutely. So this profile for somebody like that. Um, and then there's the journey as we talked about, right? Somebody is watching a video on some insurance trends, or searching for you know, usage-based insurance or you know, comparing car insurance policies. 
follows Metro Mile potentially. You mentioned Metro Mile here. You know, interestingly, it's right here. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And then potentially requesting a code, right? I mean, there's this whole journey, yeah. right? And the idea is how do we know where are they in that point? And I think all that data that we talked about essentially allows us to reach them across the entire addressable universe. Wherever they might be, being able to find them on the spot within that 100 milliseconds that we can do. That's what the power of the programmatic is all about, right? Yeah, I mean, that is absolutely the power of the programmatic. I mean, you know, when, when, when I did talk about, you know, targeting customers versus non-customers and, and that whole idea of addressable, this is the holy grail, you yeah. know, from the, from the marketing standpoint. And yes, there are consumer packaged goods companies that may not know exactly who their customers are, but you know, whether it's the insurance companies or banks or, you know, other financial institutions, you know, knowing who your current customers are and being able to deliver them a very specific message because you can target them, whether it's in video or whether it's in online display or whatever it is. I mean, it's just an awesome opportunity that we have in front of us right now. Absolutely. So what we have is we've made this really easy now. What the innovation that Acuity brought with Lumen last year was you can, as an advertiser, literally map that out on what we call a journey canvas. You can pick and select your audience, what we refer to it as we have been talking about preferred audience. We can overlay that with state incomes, all of that, right? Because so much of the insurance is really so state specific, right? Down to specific geos and so forth. Yep. So you need the ability to be able to do that. Or to your point, uh, pick up your first party audience, you know, your own CRM audience and be able to reach them and sequentially message them and be able to do that like really with discipline, uh, guiding the users without really annoying them or delivering any more than what you minimally required. That's the idea here. Um, you can pick the channel, the stage, uh, the creative type, the message, all of that can be planted right here from the single canvas and boom, you can lay that out. Here are the two audiences on which we talked about the profile. Yep. You can set up an awareness. This is for Metro Mile, really, uh, where it is first introducing itself because for people who haven't heard of it, you know, they need to know something about it. They're beautiful videos they've actually created. So that's sort of the intro to the brand. And then if they really view the video all the way through or if any other specific behaviors that we have identified here as decision diamonds here, then we move them on to the very specific proposition. You can cut your insurance, you know, you know, charge into half. There you go, boom. Like, you know, this is even bigger than what Geico could really make the case, right? You know, you know, reduce your spend down to pennies per mile. That's the kind of proposition they're throwing out there, you know? That's right. Um, and so you, you see which of these messages will actually convince somebody as the algorithm is really trying different combinations of these and boom, you straight go into the request for code, right? And I think yeah, and and, and I think in this go ahead. Sorry, I was going to interrupt you for a second. No, please go. I ahead. think in this cat in, in this category when you have so many companies still spending you know billions of dollars in in video, you know it is about branding your company so that you are you know it's just simple. This is simple marketing, right? You have to brand your company so people know who you are, so that when they whether they do the Google search or whatever you're doing that you are one of those three or four companies that they contact. You know, right now, the, the, the big keep getting bigger um, in this category because of the marketing spend that's out there and people go, oh, I got to talk to them, I got to talk to them, or I got to talk to them. You know, it is harder when, you know, you have some of these, whether they're smaller companies or digital disruptive companies that are trying to get into this business and they have a good idea. It's just, does the consumer know them? And again, a car is the second, what well, usually the second most expensive thing someone will buy in their lifetime. The house is the biggest, you know, and so which are two major pieces of, of insurance, you know, uh, part of the insurance business. So I think, you know, really understanding this journey and putting that, that awareness messaging in front of somebody as they're going through this journey is extremely important. Yeah, the idea is to get in front of them while they are making their decision, really. That's really the yeah. idea. And the other thing is just because you know that you've got awareness messaging and you've got all the subsequent messaging that's available doesn't mean everybody has to go through the whole nine yards, right? The idea is right. fast track the user. If the user is already in market, 
They're already familiar with you. They are already interacting with you. You know what? Give them their reason, you know, which is how much are they going to save, whatever other promotional messages you have. Provide the bundle if you really want to bring them into that, into multiple lines. All of those can actually happen. You don't necessarily need to go through every single thing. It's like there's no point in annoying people who already know you, right? It's like, right. I'm tired, you know, really, that lizard doesn't need to be in front of me the 20th time, you know, to me to remind me that I need to go to Geico, right? So that's just a lot of impressions that are simply wasted, right? And then be able to get the economics, get really, really detailed intelligence of this whole unified cross channel, the whole omni channel touch points. And what is it really costing you as an advertiser to migrate people and jump them from stage to stage so that you know what your incremental economics are? This is what in real time allows you to shift the spend. You know, the way you spoke about programmatic and the miracle and all of that, right? You know, I mean, look, this is the final point of it is measurability. The Absolutely. ability to know in real time how your program is performing and how you can make alterations and changes is just amazing, right? I mean, that's really what this Illumin platform is built to do. There just aren't any other solutions in programmatic out there that we know of that will allow you to carry this level of load across the channels, across the screens, across the devices, measure the touch points, give you the incremental economics and the benefit so that you really become smarter as you're running these programs in real time, right? And I think that's it. That's the marriage of the two. Unique data sets, truly the, the power of the first party and the alternative to cookies, real data, looking for truly profitable audiences, which we call preferred audiences, and managing the journey literally in real time and getting in front of the users to really give you the kind of returns. We take pride in the ability to deliver incremental returns, as you know. We right. spoke together with quite a few insurance companies and the receptivity has been truly amazing, right? So let me, let me switch for a second from here um, to Ed. Automotive we talk about. It's a very natural piece. We understand. We've kind of spent quite a bit of time here in the last few minutes. What are all the extensions of this to adjacent verticals, to applying the same logic, uh, same type of approaches, frankly, even in some cases, the same data? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, well, certainly utilizing this data can, can help in a lot of different cases, uh, especially the auto industry itself. You know, yeah. yes. if you know somebody is a preferred driver or they are, you know, let's say we know they're a preferred driver and they're a really good credit risk. Well, that means they are that much safer. And so therefore they may be looking for, uh, they may be, you know, wanting to be targeted by an auto company that focuses on safety. You know, Volvo is always that company that focuses on safety. Subaru, you know, another one. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about this from how we target within uh, the, you know, auto industry. Um, I think yeah, that there's- yeah, that point, on that point, you know, you are right. It used to be Volvo that really had the space of safety completely cornered. But if you look at the last seven to 10 years, man, that has actually been totally blown apart in the sense that the Mercedes talking about it, Lexus, Hyundai, there's a whole bunch of other car brands and OEMs who are actually going after the same. And they have benefits and product features to prove it. You see the cars that are coming out with some amazing guidance features and protection features and so forth that the brand can really stand tall on the basis of safety, right? So you really have an amazing point there in terms of how these automotive uh, companies can really go after the preferred audience, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the great thing is this is the internet and this is programmatic and, and, you know, getting your creative to be that much more tailored to, you know, a, a sub-segment of each one of these audiences could be, you know, well within a brand's need to do that Absolutely. because because you know while creative costs are creative costs you know digital is digital and sometimes it's a little cheaper um and so really looking at different creative or 
you know, to target different audiences is, is that much better in today's world than, than the mass media of just putting everything on television. And I'm not knocking television. I, there is a need for television. Oh, of, and course, it is, of course, of course, and of course. Right. Not, not just that, Ed, I think, I think you've got also the, the television's next evolution in connected TV and over the top and all of that, which is essentially carrying that same sort of behavior forward. It's just different devices, different ways of consuming. What, what hasn't changed is we as consumers love content, period, right? That's right. That yep, isn't that's exactly that is right. We love content. We love stories. Man, we, 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 we really enjoy that. And we are obviously spending a lot of time. Any others beyond the auto category? You know, it's like, because remember, the PNC is kind of a natural space for you, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, while we're going down this route with auto insurance, I think there's a lot of opportunity in some, um, a lot of the new internet of things, devices out there that can really talk about homeowners insurance, you know, Insurance companies have always given you a discount if you have a burglar alarm or if you have fire alarms, you know, but now that you have the new ring camera system on your doorbell or, or the Nest device in your home that really measures more of what's going on in your home than just the air conditioning and the heater, um, I think there's a lot of data sources that we haven't tapped into yet, but like we said, once the cookie goes away, we're going to need to really start tapping into some of these sources to give us an idea of who the better prospects are for our insurance product, whether that's Absolutely. homeowners, correct. Or, yep. you know, even down to the personal articles policy and the classic car insurance policy. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, totally, totally there. Um, uh, we are sort of at a stage where, frankly, I can keep going and keep asking you questions because I, I love to talk with you about all these different things because it's so interesting topic. There's so much evolution that has happened. But at that point, I think we to, to do justice, we really need to let Joanna come into the picture and yeah. uh, let's take some questions because I, I, love this, I love this part of the conversations always because there's always some interesting questions there. So Joanna, back to you, help us manage this and moderate this please. Always happy to bring justice to the conversation. So um, we do have a lot of questions today. So please, everyone, feel free to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, type into the Q&A or as well the chat functionality. We can see both on our end. Uh, we're going to start from the top. And uh, if we don't get around to your question, then we'll certainly follow up with you uh, post-event. The first question that we have coming in is, um, can you tell us a bit about the difference between uh, UBI products and preferred driver prospecting? Well, I mean, I think, you know, from that standpoint, you know, there, there is kind of a crossover of the two, you know, uh, there's a lot of preferred drivers that are great prospects for uh, user-based insurance products. And so I think that we really need to examine, you know, who are you know, who is that age group? Who is that demographic that is really, you know, utilizing the usage-based uh, insurance products and then bringing that in? It's just another data source for us to look at as we can refine the targeting even more within that preferred audience. You know, there's exactly. a, yeah. you yeah. know, from a shopper standpoint, you know, there might be 50% preferred audience out there and 50% standard, non-standard shopping. Well, we can define that 50% that shopping and the preferred that much further, you know, into what type of product and what type of creative you might want to put in front of that person, whether it's just about safety or whether you think they want saved by the mile insurance or user-based insurance. Yeah, essentially the way I see it is the usage-based products is really a more product attribute in terms of what kind of a product you want to sell. Preferred drivers will be preferred in the sense from an audience perspective. We've got the audience who is caring about the fact that they are safe, whether they are using it more or less doesn't really generally matter, right? But, but, but there are going to be some, to your point, who will be driving less and therefore they are appropriate target for UBI products. But anyway, that's Absolutely. the way I would look at it, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, another question coming in, uh, as a growing online insurance marketplace, what would you suggest the ratio be for marketing budget between brand spend versus acquisition spend? 
you know, it's it, it's a good question. And certainly, um, you know, uh, having been at State Farm, I know relatively what theirs are. I know what, you know, the category is because we certainly look at and, and consider what the what the spends are out there. And, and, and to a certain extent, it depends on budget and it depends on how well, you know, what your awareness is in the marketplace. It's very seldom you're going to get someone to click on your display ad or even your search listing if nobody knows about your brand. And so in some cases, if you only have a $10 million budget, you might need to spend 75% of that on the brand and 25% on, on you know, driving, driving the quotes and, and, and more you know, lower funnel stuff because nobody knows who you are. Therefore, you're not going to get what you need out of it. Um, you know, on the other side of things, you know, I mean, Geico spends about a billion of that $1.6 billion in video and primarily television. So they're somewhere in the 60 to 70 percent range. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so it, 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 it very much varies based on what it is. But uh, going to what uh, Siraj was talking about in the journey, you know, type of thing where we can journey map this thing, you know, we can test it and, and see where you're at, you know. Again, it's easy to spend a half a billion dollars or a billion dollars to figure it out. It's much more difficult in this category to spend, you know, under fifty million dollars and make a difference. Yes, exactly. I think uh, the you, you know, Ed, I couldn't have said it better in the way you described it. That when you map it out as a journey across brand spend for awareness, for engagement, and for sort of lower funnel conversion. We absolutely do testing of this sort in terms of, you know, how does the lower funnel statistics, conversion benchmarks change when you shift the spend on the brand side of it, right? And in yep. general, if you look at the past 20 years of study across categories, your benchmarks in the industry are very close. They're roughly long-term sustainable if the brand is known and is aware reasonably well it's a 60-40 investment to really preserve the brand awareness and top of mind, right? Yeah. 60 branding, 40% lower funnel. It tends to work out reasonably well. Great. So a few questions here about Illumin and I'm gonna to try to um, consolidate a little bit. So one was regarding uh, Illumin's media footprint and a separate one that perhaps we can answer simultaneously is uh, whether the plan uh, to focus growth with Illumin is by democratizing it for all businesses to advertise or a strategy of both by still targeting larger companies who have paid professionals to advertise. So. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, okay, let me, uh, Ed, it's okay, we, I take it? You take it. <laughs> all right. Um, you. Yeah, so number one, the footprint, right? So the footprint for Illumin is the open internet which is generally the programmatic space we are talking about outside of the walled garden. So if you stay out of Facebook and Google, and you can even add Amazon to that, uh, we're talking about the 40% of the publisher footprint all over the internet, which is part of the Illumin footprint. And as you noticed earlier when I mentioned it, it covers the entire spectrum of addressable media from connected TV, OTT, it covers online video, covers display, mobile, desktop, the whole range, including audio uh, and podcast and so forth, which is also becoming quite popular as part of the streaming uh, uh, media. Now, the next question on that was, who are the uh, customers, right? Which is like, who are the big users or uh, current users as well as anticipated users we look at it being a split between agencies who support the brands and the direct brands. Now, man, there are many brands who are actually bringing programmatic in-house. And so those who are actually bringing programmatic in-house will find that they wouldn't have to invest as much in very high priced talent if they used this form of interface an execution environment like the journey canvas available through Illumin because that just makes it that much easier. The learning curve is really fast. And so they can really bring their people up to speed very quickly. If you just go through the demo, you'll see and you'll experience that you can get up to speed literally within a day. Uh, to do simple things, of course, you need to spend a week or two to really do more sophisticated things and activations. Uh, so that's that. 
in the agency space, frankly, the entire spectrum, we are beginning to see that the small and medium tier agencies are beginning to use it a lot more because they don't really have some sort of a vested interest from the holding company mandating them to use it one thing or the other. And so there, they're far more open to experimentation. If they wanted to use new innovation, they are far more welcoming, more inclined to test. And so that really makes it far more amenable and easy for us to bring them on board. And we are also running a lot of training programs as well for those who are interested. Great, okay, I'm gonna to try to squeeze two more questions and we have five minutes left. Um, the first one is just talking about uh, you know, we took a look earlier at uh, the difference between brand equity programs um, as well as performance programs. And traditionally, those are run as separate programs. And uh, the question is, does Illumin propose a bridge between these types of campaigns? Well, that's exactly what Ed mentioned earlier, right? Because the idea is, as opposed to really testing them in isolation, if you have it consolidated as one continuum from the very equity focused, awareness focused programs and being able to see its impact on how people engage and then eventually how they actually convert and become part of like requesting code and really signing up and so forth. I think you have so much flexibility in understanding those statistics. I mean, we get these questions really all the time. People simply don't know because bringing all those pieces together into a single environment and being able to see like, where's the incrementality? Very hard to do any other way. And so this is our way of bringing sort of the solution into the marketplace. Yes. Great, okay. Can um, we wrap up by talking a bit about the uh, exclusive data that was um, introduced and uh, at what cost does this come to traditional uh, digital advertising uh, campaigns? Oh, I see. So, you know, Ed and I have been obviously speaking as we have been negotiating, you know, partnerships and so forth to really bring all this data set, which will be exclusive to the way we use it, Lumen. The whole idea of preferred drivers and then all these overlays that we do on top of it, whether they are income or net worth or investments or anything else that you overlay as third party or even geo that's built on it. Data does cost you money. There's no question about that. It's always incremental data insertions to get you more precise first party uh, ability to target with precision always has some incremental cost to it. But to make it easy, we generally, when advertisers want to test this out in the initial phase in the first three months, six months, what have you, we tend to bundle in the cost of that so that we can absorb it as added value to the advertisers who actually want to test the Illumin platform and really see the performance and the impact that they actually get or all the insights they're able to gather from it. Uh, we will generally fund it uh, out of pocket as an investment for you. Um, but then if you really see the performance, then you wouldn't have any issues, frankly, paying for the data explicitly. Okay, great. We've just got about two minutes left. There's a there's one quick um, quick one that you could kind of touch on if you guys just want to uh, do one more before uh, saying goodbye. Um, and someone has asked Ed, who do you believe <laughs> are the up and coming insurance companies that you believe will change the way we buy insurance? That might be a cool way to end. You know, it's it, it's interesting, and and I think we're we're kind of at this inflection point of, you know, there's the safe and easy, okay? There's the safe and easy of Geico, Progressive, State Farm, Allstate, Nationwide, Liberty Mutual. These are these are known brands, and 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 this is this is insurance, and it's very, you know, when you buy insurance, you're trying to mitigate risk, and so, um, you know, going. This isn't the wrong way to say it, but sometimes going with the unknown is, is a little bit more difficult. And I think what the opportunity of the digital disruptors, whether it's root insurance, which is focused 100% on preferred drivers, um, you know, and and trying to drive that audience to them, not the standard and non-standard. Or when you look at, you know, uh, let's use let's use Metro Mile again, which is just pay by the mile. It's, it's trying to go to a sub-segment of the overall audience versus, you know, the bigger players who want to be there for everybody. You know, 
Geico has a price for everybody. Progressive has a price for everybody. State Farm has a price usually for everybody, unless you have a number of major accidents, and then you know they don't want they don't want to insure you. Um, not many people would, but you know there's a price for everybody. It's just dependent on what that price is, and I think that you know as you know what I haven't seen enough of is that these you know. Um, the clear covers, the root, you know, root I'm starting to see, you know, with the partnership with Bubba Wallace, uh, but Metro Mile, I've seen some stuff here and there, Mile Insurance, haven't seen a whole lot from them, you know, in the marketplace is that there needs to be more awareness driven up. I mean, I'm seeing more zebra advertising, you know, which is an aggregator than I'm seeing, you know, the companies that are partnering with the zebra. And that so, is so true. That is so true, Ed. This is very interesting, right? Because yeah. it's, the, it's the aggregators and the sort of the uh, lead qualifiers, so to speak, right, are the ones who are right. really trying to be more front and center and really playing the game quite aggressively, right? Abs oh, my God, absolutely. I mean, we won't even talk about the whole lead generation space and <laughs> lead, the lead aggregators. And I mean, it is a ridiculous frenemy of the auto insurance industry. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but would, but yeah. I, think, I think, you know, everybody has a chance. I think that you have to get out there ahead of the competition. And if there's any time for investment spending in this category, right now is that time because, you know, the amount of people shopping for insurance has never been as high. And you know, as I've, you know, as we've seen, you know, the amount of people shopping for insurance continues to grow, but it's never grown this quickly, this fast. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a very good point. Months. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Ed. That was, a, that was a good way to really, really reach closure on this one, because there is a sense of urgency. This is a big year for the insurance uh, companies. Uh, Ed, it is so nice of you to join me today in this conversation. I always learn so much from you. I'm, and I'm sure that our audience actually just learned as much or even more uh, from all the, all the wisdom you shared. Uh, and thank you so much for doing this. Joanna, no it was fun. Joanna, thank you so much for organizing this thing. You put a lot of your heart and soul into the presentation uh, and organizing this thing. Jackson did the same, your team with Jason. Uh, all of you guys really put so much into this thing. This couldn't have been done without your help. Um, and for the audience, you are so generous. Thank you for joining us today. We always, always love to have these kinds of forums and we like to bring new perspectives with new people, new experts and new verticals. And we'll continue to do that um, in, in the future in different verticals, of course, and other opportunities that we get. In the meantime, if you have any suggestions for us, obviously let us know. Thank you so much again and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.